Labrīt visiem! Good morning, everyone! Es tiešām principā jūs jūs viss šeit redzēt mūsu seminārā par spēļu izstrādi un par to, kā apgūt spēļu izstrādi augstskolās. Šo semināru organizē Alberta koledža, un es esmu Alberta koledža studiju programmas spēļu izstrāde un attīstība direktors, sadarbībā ar Zviedrijas vēstniecību un Svidišu institūtu. Paldies arī viņiem par iesaistīšanu no šī semināra organizēšanā. Šodien mūsu darba kārtība ir šāda. Vispirms mums būs mūsu viesis Adam Mais, kurš prezentēs savu prezentāciju games The Three E's – Entertainment, Education and Expression. Tad mums pēc šīs prezentācijas būs diskusija jautājuma un atbildes, un tad pēc tam mums pievienosies Albert Koleģa pasniedzējs un CIA Next Level izapiešanieks Andrejs Kļaviņš ar savu stāstu par spēļu izstrādi un dizainu. Pēc šīm divām prezentācijām mums būs neliela diskusija, kafijas pauze, un tad tie, kas vēlēsies redzēt to, kā notiek spēļu izstrāde Albert Koleģā, ko ir izstrādājuši Albert Koleģa studenti, gribētu palikt uz Albert Koleģa studenta datoru spēļu izstrādi. Tātad šobrīd es došu vārdu mūsu viesim no Gotlandas universitātes ar prezentāciju. Okay, I would like to welcome Adam Mays from Gotland University. Uh, so yeah, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Is the microphone on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Adam Mays. I'm the subject responsible for game design at almost Uppsala University campus, Gotland. Though I prefer subject responsible. Um, I'm not very good with that whole responsibility thing. I set vision for game design education, and I've been doing that for two years now. Um, it's almost Uppsala University, because in about three weeks' time, we stop being Herg School in Gotland and become Campus Gotland at Uppsala, and I start working at the oldest university in Sweden, and I'm very nervous. So, this was going to be the title. Um, because of that three, the three rule thing, I had two S's and no third one. And I thought, well, okay, I'll just shove something else up there. Something will come to me in the time I get to it. And I'm writing the summary, uh, education and expression and then stuff. Oh, I have three E's. So it became that. And I wrote the summary before I wrote the presentation. And the summary was brilliant. And, uh, Halfway through writing it, I think I have oversold the idea, but um, let's see if we can wing this. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, games aren't what you think they are. How I see games. Games as an expression. How the hell do I teach this profit? One of the things we do is the too long didn't read slide. Um, because it's an hour, and you may want to grab a coffee or run to the loo. So if you want to run out at any point, these are the takeaways that you're going to get. You can't define games by their most obvious titles. All games are systems, and if you can express something as a system, then you can make it as a game. And all game education needs to start with design. So, games aren't what you think they are. This is Alan Moore. Um, I read an awful lot of comics. It's my biggest, well, one of my biggest, it's one of the vices that I have. And uh, Alan Moore wrote huge amounts of comics that are now being made into movies. And he hates this. Um, the argument was that I wanted to give comics a special place when I was writing things like Watchmen. I wanted to show off just what the possibilities of the comic book medium were, and films are completely different. He then says, 
that if we only see comics in relation to movies, then the best that they will ever be is films that don't move. And he has a point. This is a page from The Dark Knight Returns, a very small page. Um, Frank Miller wrote this back in the 80s. Um, it was the beginning of the very dark Batman. So that page will be under A4. It's a 4x4 four four column, so that's 16 frames on a page smaller than A4. On that page, they have artwork, which needs to tell a story. There has to have lettering that needs to not obscure the artwork. The pace of this page becomes much slower because suddenly we have a lot of text, a lot of images going on. It dictates what we're seeing shot by shot. And it also makes this page all the more dramatic because we've gone slow, 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 bam. So why am I showing you comics and the thing about games? I agree with Adam and I think that games are an expressive medium and they can be much more than just movies and if we make them just movies all we're going to end up is just sad sad summer blockbusters so how do i see them if i see game you probably see this you might see this you probably don't see this thomas was alone is a game about rectangles in fact, that's how they describe it. It was the best game about rectangles that year. Um, the rectangles are AIs in a network. And it's a puzzle game about trying to move AIs through network holes to uh, let them access different areas of the network. To the Moon is a game about making you cry like a baby. Um, it deals with death and autism and love and following your dreams and it's beautiful and every step of the way you go i know what this is about i know what this is about and then you get to the end why have they done this to me um if you've never played it it's on steam and it's always cheap you should play that so games aren't what you see on the shelves and it's easy to say this but then let's Look at other mediums and see how ridiculous it is to say that all games are just shooting. So here's movies, and I'm going to cheat now because I'm about to compare apples and oranges. No money is really made um, on box office. So every time games say we're bigger than movies, they mean we're bigger than box office. But movies make all their money in DVD sales and merchandise. But 2012. That was how much box office took in the States. Um, that's how many tickets were sold at that average price. That's a fair amount of money um, for domestic theatre in the US. There's $3,075 spent every second on adult material. Each second, 28,000 internet users are viewing porn, and every 39 minutes, a new adult video is being produced. Not only for DVDs and the internet, but for your mobile phones as well. All movies are not porn movies. Now, obviously, easy to point at porn in the movies, um, and movies, you know, the cheap thing. So let's look at books. There was a book series written by a British woman sold over 70 million copies worldwide. With the book rights have been sold in over 37 countries and it set the record as the fastest selling paperback of all time. Not those books. It'll be these ones. Surpassing the Harry Potter series, that became the fastest selling paperback of all time. Not all books are bad vanilla BDSM romance novels. Media isn't defined by one type of content and games shouldn't be either. And it's a ridiculous generalization that we constantly fight with. And to be fair, it's one that we should fight with. If anyone's seen the EA, EEA, E3 coverage, 
this year, you would be forgiven to think that we only make games that are shooters. Did anyone see it? Have you seen Rise? Rise is the new Crytek game. No one's from Crytek here, are they? Great. Rise is the new Crytek game. It's um, oh, it's Call of Duty. It's in the Roman Empire. You're a centurion. It's Call of Duty Swords and Sandals Edition with quick time events. I think potentially you might control the guy running around, but on the whole, awful. And there is a problem with mainstream game content. This is Ian Bogost, academic and curmudgeon. He complains about everything he possibly can from his academic ivory tower. He's a very clever man, but... Oh, he, um, he said at GDC this year that it's hypocritical for games to claim freedom of speech and then have nothing to say. Um, having played the game that made me cry like a baby, I would disagree with him. But as students of game design, it will be your job when you get out there to make games have something to say. But why is this important? You know, it's just games. Games for kids. Yes, it could just all be blood and boobs and angry birds, but it shouldn't matter. Here's why it matters. Games are the primary entertainment source for 126 million millennials in the US and the EU. And if we can level that games cause hideous addiction and they cause people to pick up guns and shoot people and games are just as terrible as movies and rock music and punk and Marilyn Manson and everything else that came before it. We need to be able to say that we are better because we will have an influence on this 126 million people. So if games aren't content, what do I mean when I talk about games? These just all went in this morning. This is Brian Moriarty, a veteran game designer, now lectures at Professor of Interactive Media. You can read that. Um, he was super influential in his time and has done some of the best presentations I've ever seen. At GDC 2012, he talked about his education and asked, what's a game? Because he's been making them all his life, but he's never had to define it. His definition was this, a screen that is badly uh, formatted. A toy is something that elicits play. So a ball and two jumpers. You may throw the jumpers around and kick the ball, but it's, there's nothing there. It's just something that you will play with. The moment you put two jumpers down on the floor, designate the line between them as a goal, that the ball passing between that line scores a point, you give it rules and then you have a game. A puzzle is a game with a solution. This is Jane McGonigal, um, astounding designer and hippie. She wrote the book Reality is Broken, a book that states that game design can save the world. Uh, if you've never read that book, I would absolutely grab a copy of that. Brilliant. It's, it's a huge leap to ask at the beginning, but if you accept her leap, absolutely astounding book. And the stuff that she's done is brilliant. Um, she asked, what's a game in, the, in, in her book? And so she says, a game has four traits. A goal, a specific outcome that players can achieve. Rules, limitations on how you reach that goal. There's a feedback system which shows how close the goal is, and there's voluntary participation, a willingness to accept goal rules and feedback. So, at the moment we've just said this. How is that important? How can looking at games in just that simple way help? Let's look at taxes. Taxes have a goal to pay them without being audited or not. Rules that you can all abide by, you pay a certain amount of money. Feedback that's a bit rubbish, oh, always a spelling mistake in everyone. And, well, it's not voluntary participation, but it's mandatory. You have to participate, unless you're a major corporation and funnel all your earnings through Ireland. 
So let's sprinkle magic game design dust on this and let's see what we can do with it. Let's improve that feedback loop. Taxes are used for all manner of things. Hospitals, roads, social security. So how about when a tax threshold has been crossed, we mail a tax paper, taxpayer a postcard and say thank you. Thank you, this child has dialysis for six months. Thank you, a retiree has hospital care for the rest of the year. Thank you, our troops are now better protected because of your contribution. Thank you, our nation's children have school books. Suddenly taxes are put back into the community. You have a communal goal. You have a proper sense of being as one. Taxes that are used in your area can be built that way. We're going to build a sports centre and we're X percent of the way. This month, thanks to your contributions, we can break ground on this. This was suggested to me by a third year um, in my class. He suggested that if we reframe the grind and focus on the reward, suddenly taxes aren't a horrible thing that you do. They're the necessary thing that improves your society. And of course, we have to properly punish the cheaters. But the thing about this is, it's a game. It's an expression of a game. Tax systems expressed as a game. You can disconnect your content from your rule system, and suddenly your rule system can be used to express everything. So every time we do this presentation, we want to talk about systems, and it's really a bit tedious. We get to this point, and we write the system slides, and we go, yeah, let's not do this, because it's horrible. But I'm going to have to. I will be fast. A system is defined as a set of interacted elements that form an integrated whole with a common goal or purpose. Games are also systems, and at the heart of every game is a set of formal elements that, when set in motion, creates a dynamic experience with which the players engage. Unlike most systems, it's not the goal of the game to create a product, perform a task, or simplify a process, it's to entertain its participants. This is Tracy Fullerton from Game Design Workshop. The basic elements of systems are objects, properties and behaviours and relationships. Objects within the system interact with each other according to their properties and behaviours and their relationships, causing changes to the system state. How these changes are manifested depend on the nature of the objects and their interactions. Told you. So, I have a whole bunch of slides that I give to my in the very first class of the very first year of the game course, which is all about systems and systems analysis and systems design. We define objects and properties and behaviors and relationships, and it's a massive wall of text. And the students get to ask if they understand, and they say, yes, you sure you understand? And then I show them 30 seconds of this game. And we break this game down. And it's brilliant. We break this game down, and each alien is an object. The um, covers are collections of objects that can be destroyed. Each bullet is a different one. There's a win and lose condition. And they break this down, and we have a wall of whiteboards just covered in, in data. So we get to the end of this, and we talk about how this is Space Invaders. I say, so if Space Invaders looks like this, if you tip that down so it's flat, and then 3D everything, so you just raise everything off the ground, here's a wall. <laughs> and they all go, no, it can't, but, and there you have it. So I've just ruined games for you as well. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> And this is, again, how we see games. It's not the content. It's the systems underneath it. So, systems exist throughout the natural and man-made world. And whenever we see complex behavior emerging from interactions between discrete elements, 
And if we can identify and analyze a system, we can apply it to game systems. And if we can do that, we can express that system through a game or examine that system through a game. Ah, I need to swap out now. So I have a couple of movies. How am I going to do this? I've, uh, I'm a Mac boy, so no. Is there a no? <laughs> uh, go to desktop. There. No. Okay, let's do that. This is, and let me full screen this, if I can remember how that's done. There. This is The End of Us. It was a game made at a game jam. This runs for about four minutes. Um, you play the purple meteor. Has anyone played this? Okay. So you play the purple meteorite and you start flying around and this orange meteorite appears. Um, and it bumps into you and it circles around you and it's all very sweet. Well, this will be the longest four minutes of my life. And you can bump against each other. You can race each other. But it's all very lovely. Come on, come on. So we change levels. And with the change of levels, we get different um, challenges. Drops out of sync when I converted it. And you can challenge each other for the stars, depending on which asteroid goes over them. Game jam day, 48 hours. So, stage three. I believe we have an external threat. And a great big red ugly countdown. And every blow damages the meteorite. So you can choose to take the blows for your companion. But then this happens. And there is no game over. You just carry on flying around on your own until you quit. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is a very small trailer for uh, one of our fourth year games. Our third, second year games, rather.
the, I'm going to go back and pause one of the slides here. Um, so the programmer who proposed this game has crushing social anxiety. Oh, it doesn't do that. That's frustrating. Um, has crushing social anxiety to the point where there were times he couldn't make it into the university to wake, work on the game that he wants to make. And effectively, everybody in the school has a view cone. And if they see you, your anxiety increases. Um, you can hide in the toilet, which will bring back your confidence. <coughs> but generally, if it gets too bad, you can hit space and go home. And he says, this is what it's like for him every day. So the entire game is a school, and you have to get to class before the class starts. Um, but you can't be seen by anyone. And he built a stealth game, effectively, about social anxiety. Hey, let me see if I can get back. I can. And that should be this. Oh. Let's shift F5. Shift F5. Will that still do it now? Uh, no. no. Okay, hang on. Systems, systems. There we go. So, systems are everywhere. And if you can analyze and break down something into a system, you can apply it to make a game from it. Everything from crushing social anxiety to love and loss and courtship. So in the last two games, something was being communicated and actively communicated. And as a player, you have to engage with the game to be part of that experience. And of course, by doing that, you then become part of the system. Your participation causes changes in that system that you then react to and create new play experiences. It's in the dynamic between you and the game that that communication occurs. So we just held a conference at Gotland, and this year was on diversity. Two days of stunning material that's on YouTube. Heidi McDonald was there. She works at Jesse Shell's Shell Games, and she did a presentation that spoke in part about identity tourism. The idea that by role-playing in a game, you can safely explore aspects of your personality that you might not otherwise show. And people say that when you do this in an MMO, that's a bad thing because other people can be hurt or affected by this. But she says in a single player game, there's a degree of safety there. There isn't that ambiguity about this identity tourism that you're doing. So her presentation was about presentation of characters in romantic subplots. And she looked at people who play these games and why. She set up a questionnaire and then mined this for data for her research. And she presented this slide. Twenty-five percent of women served identified as bisexual, and several of these women said the reason they play a romance female to female characters is that they're in monogamous heterosexual relationships, and gaming is the only outlet to express the other side of that sexuality. Games offer the ability to create safe and transformative spaces. And to agree that the degree, they already do so. And if anyone that's been to Second Life is aware that there's very many transformative spaces on there. This is way beyond pew pew, kiss kiss, bang bang. So I pulled this out of a website that Design of interactive products require effective communication with the end users. And this is kind of true because who reads manuals anymore? You, know, you learn to play games by playing games. So that each product via its interface design has to tell the player what features it offers, how to use those features, why they should care about those features, um, and crafting that, that interface, that experience, um, takes time and effort. 
And it's not just code or just art. It's the combination of code and art and design working together under the whip of the producer. Every time you build something like this, you get better at building it. But as long as you, and this is me soapboxing, as long as we just keep doing the same work that we've done before, then all we get better at is making the same type of game. What do you want to say? How do you want to say it? And why do you want to say it like that? This should be the start of every game project. I do a lecture um, on level design and we get students building narrative levels without words in Knit, Knit Adventures. Um, and they spend, they get a bunch of time and they get a whole set of lectures on symbolism and architecture and the works. And they're told, go away, build a level, and they all build caves. They all build caves. And the first year I did this, um, student after student after student, and then they go, the girl goes into a cave, and then there's monsters, and they come out of the cave. And it was really annoying me. And after about the seventh or eighth one, it's like, I know why this is annoying me. So the guy finishes his presentation. Any questions, he asks. I have a question. Caves have a specific meaning in literature. There's very strong symbolism around caves, and you have a cave game full of symbolism. What does your cave mean? And there was silence. It's like, well, it's just a cave. So I just put that down as fear of vagina then. And he's like, what? No. Well, let's have a look. Young girl enters cave full of monsters that escape and kill her family. What do you think it means? And student after student came up with a cave. And it's like, I'm sorry, I just built a cave. The last guy, his game, character female goes up, can't pass anywhere, goes back to the edge of the water, can't go that way. Comes back and there's this giant monster who gives her the key to his cave. And she goes in and there's monsters and they get out and generally blah, blah, blah. And the end, he ends his presentation with, and because it's a story, everything means everything like it should. Great then, they say, I, what does your cave mean? Probably means I'm a dirty child pervert or something. <laughs> um, but what do you want to say? Have something to say. What do you want to say? Why do you want to say it like you do and how are you going to say it? And this is the heart of games, design. Communicating an idea and having the player experiment with that idea. So this crosses over, and I'm really hoping that this movie plays. Oh, and of course it doesn't. Ah! Um, it is. I'm going to cheat by moving my machine really close to the microphone. Even though you can't see it, you'll be able to hear it, hopefully. Ugh, but not by pressing space and moving on to... So what should you learn if you want to be a game designer? You ready? Everything. Seriously, game design is the art of crafting experiences, and you'll find yourself drawing on everything you have. To a great game designer, there is no useless knowledge. But... And that's true. You should learn everything to be a game designer. And that also includes learning how to be the communication bridge between programmers and artists because they speak two very fundamentally different languages. And you need to speak to both of them. You should know what playwright David Mamet says about set design and what he says about set. He says, quickly checking how much time you have. Okay, what he says about set design. Chairs in cafeterias are built in a certain way. They're built to be comfortable enough to eat on, but not comfortable enough that you want to stay there forever. They're built in a way that they're easily wiped clean because people need to come in and get out and they're spilling. When you put a scene in a play in a cafeteria, the chairs that you choose are right for the characters. 
So when a character comes in, you instantly know which seat they will take because you know that character. When you are designing characters for games, why does your character wear what he wears? Why does he walk the way he walks? Why does she carry this gun? Why is your character like that? You should watch Project Runway and see how clothes designers talk about their creations. I love this show for so many reasons, Tim being one of them. Um, the end. So tell us about your design. And they can. I cut this this way because cut this way, this clothes says this, or it stands like this, or it hangs like this. I used this fabric because it costs this amount but looks expensive when it's made. They can tell the story of the person wearing their clothing from concept to finished piece. And you should be able to do that with your games. You should talk about architectural spaces to know how they can make your, player, make your audience feel. Confined spaces, make them feel trapped. Open spaces, make them feel free, unless it's a stealth game, in which case it makes them feel vulnerable. Light and dark uh, passages with shadows in a stealth game are awesome because those are places that you can hide. In a survival horror game, those are awful because those are places where you can get eaten. You should know about R and metrics, and you should apply that to your design. R is metrics and design for piracy. It stands for acquisition, activation, <laughs> retention, bless you, referral and revenue. Um, acquisition is where your audience comes from. Activation is the happy first experience. Retention is them coming back. Referral is them to tell their friends how good their experience was. And revenue is when you start taking money from them. Um, it's awesome. And since I started designing and heard out about this, changed the way I design. Uh, World of Warcraft. Hated it when I first started playing. I was in the States when it launched. I played Anarchy years and years and years ago. And went into WoW and went, so it's cartoony and I'm still killing things that aren't attacking me. In the years that have gone by, is this the best that we can do? I'm not sure I want to keep playing this, which is a shame because I've been looking forward to this game when I have a Mac and there's not many games on it. And then I got a level. And the actual thought process was this. I don't know if I'm going to... Fwang. Oh, I like that. I want... A Another one of those. And the leveling noise and light hit buttons that made me just want to grind through 40th level, which was the longest level ever. And stop playing now, but my first experience of that game was not good, not good, brilliant. And that's how you need to think about it. Then there's stuff. I've got to, he says, reaching into his magic bag. I had as a set of these books, 101 Things I Learned. This is in fashion school. There's architect school, culinary school, and film school. In the one about culinary school, they talk about, don't just think how the food looks on the plate. Think how it looks on the fork coming to the eater's mouth. Because you need to be able to make your food attractive at every stage. Blizzard talked about when they first made Diablo, they had to make the click interesting. And if they couldn't make the click interesting, then Diablo would have failed as a game. If every click in your game isn't interesting, then how are you going to keep your players clicking? And you should read, and read everything. An ex of mine have married Ian Banks, and Ian Banks just died. Horrible. Ian Banks just died. He wrote a selection of science fiction um, setting a universe of the culture. The culture is a post-scarcity, they're alien, so very post-humanity. They 
gland. They have glands put in that will secrete various um, chemicals that they then can use at various points. They um, change sex at will. And so most people in the culture have a child and father a child. And just mind-blowing stuff. He wrote a book called Player of Games. In this book, he describes a game that the civilization plays. And everybody on the planet plays this game. And depending on how well you do, depends where you are in society. And the winner becomes president. And culture goes in to affect this game and destabilize this civilization. But they describe how it's played and the extent to what it's played about a third of the way through the book. I remember being on a station in Scotland having read that and having to stop and call everybody I know because it was so impressive as a game. I want to make that game. And you should practice. As designers, as coders, as artists, you should practice. So here's one that we do. In games, we spend all of our time moving, and yet movement is the least designed thing in a game. Even in the parkour games, it's arguably the least designed thing in the game. In WoW, movement was a punishment, and the solution was first getting to 40th and now 20th when you can get a horse. They knew how miserable movement was, but you've got to keep playing before we can make it fun. So what does movement mean to you? Design a game where movement is key, where it says something, where the ground you walk on says something, or where traveling is something that you want to communicate, or where there's no movement at all. But design games. Give yourself ridiculous um, rules and complications. I would, excuse me, sneeze. Oh, it's going to hang there. Okay. Um, I want, I recently watched the uh, Paralympics. I want to make EA Paralympic Blind Soccer. How does that game work? And everyone says, well, there's a ball in the bell. So, a bell in a ball, rather. So that's how they know where it is. How do they know where the other players are? How do they know where the goal is? Can you imagine turning, EA, it's in the game. And then you boot up your game and it's just black and there's noises. I want to see a game like that. So how the hell do you teach this? with blood and sweat and weeping. Um, we currently teach a two-year program. We used to teach a three-year program, um, but we had everyone drop out at the end of the second year and get jobs. We also have a horrific dropout in programmers. We lose five, 20, no, a fifth of our programmers in the first 10 weeks. And we can start with about 40 programmers at the beginning of the program. And in the third year, we can be down to 10. Um, but the program we teach now is a two-year program with the option to top up to a degree. So that way, you can do the two years, get a job, or you can stay for the third year and get a degree. And the major is game design, and the minor is programming or art. But we also find that people swap those out for production and business management, and we're trying to build a proper production wing that can go in there. It's design heavy, with two thirds of the courses uh, dedicated to design or design led subjects. But both of these things work together, and they do design together. And it's split up so that autumn you get your theory and your skills and your tool sets, spring you do production. And the production is generally a safety netted production. And then in summer, you do validation and reflection. So it looks like this, pretty ugly. Um, so the, oh, what I need is a stick. Um, the initial, so that's two years. Each column is a 10 week period. The first red column is your first 10 weeks, and that's uh, where you really start getting your theory. The next 10 weeks, 
that's two five weeks and a ten week. So halfway we split up at uh, Christmas. So red to blues, Christmas. The next one in the first year is an introduction to game development. This is where they get to build space shooters for the very first time. And they, we teach them space shooters. And it's the first digital game that they make as a group because it's just backward scrolling and the enemies and it's easy. The next one, which is the big clump at the end, is theme arcade. So we take noobs that presumably have never done any coding, never done any design. We throw them through a design course and art and programming we make them build a space shooter together where they learn how hard it is to talk to each other and then we say you've got 10 weeks go and build an arcade game in an arcade box with a new and novel interface device off you go and then we kind of leave them to it. We wander around and we make sure that they're okay and that they have some support, but we don't really get involved. So this year we had a game that was controlled by telepathy. They got some mind devices and uh, camera eye tracking, head tracking software, and they built these into wizard hats. And they built their own box and they stood in front of the box and you concentrated and you picked up falling blocks moved them across the screen, broke concentration till they fell, and it was the guy who could drill the highest hat. Um, we had a game built in Connect, which was a shark punching game. You were a surfer on a surfboard, and you had to surf around and punch shark and starfish, but avoid punching dolphins. Um, <laughs> We had some typical just button mashing arcade games, but these were first years. This was the first proper game, that we, and then we just brought in. We had Tom Abernathy who wrote the story for Halo Reach, and we had people from Shell Games, and we had uh, lecturers from other universities who came there and then judged them and gave them feedback on their games. Um, and then we do the same thing in the second year. Um, we have a couple of electives now in the second year that are new. We're doing one on social games and we're doing one on applied game design. So taking game designs and making it um, work with other research projects and stuff like this. But we teach design as the bridge. All our code is taught as new for games specifically. And we try as much as possible to teach programming to support game design that's come before. Every time we teach art, we try and teach art. So here are your basics on art, but we teach art. So here is a game design project you've done. Here is the art you need to do. If you're now making art, make art for that game project. In our second year, we teach um, board games. And we've just managed to buy a 3D printer. So we can now start having artists making art for a board game and then 3D printing it. So the plan is to teach students to be both academically sound as well as industry ready, as well as being interested enough to do research because Uppsala is a research university. And so there's enough balls in the air to keep me very busy. Next academic year, I'm going to take the first year through an 80-20 education stream because I've just, I want this to work. 80-20 is a design rule that asserts that approximately 80% of the effects generated by a large system are caused by 20% of the variables in that system. And it's viewed everywhere. So 80% of the traffic in a city is caused by 20% of its roads. 80% of the functions, 80% of the work done in a program of course by 20% of its features. Um, so this is really useful for focusing resources and realizing a greater efficiency in game design. If you know that, make the 20% of features that you need to use readily available either on your joystick or from your menu bar. Um, I'm using this for education. So in the first three weeks, they're going to be taught systems analysis and documentation and MDA.
Do we, if I say MDA, do you look at me blankly? Okay, very quickly. MDA is the Hanaki and Robin Hanaki, who was part of the group that made Journey, and Mark LeBlanc, not Matt LeBlanc. Mark LeBlanc and someone else came up with this formalized method of designing games. Um, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. Mechanics are the rule set. Dynamics is how that interacts within the game with the player, and aesthetics is what we want to make the player feel. And design, we should look at it this way. Users look at it the other way. They look at how they make it feel, they understand the dynamics that are at play, and then they do the rule set. So I build an RTS game. It's a gather and build game. If I have lots and lots of regenerating resources, the dynamic of that game is very different. So if I have one set of resources in the middle of the map, that when it's done, it's done. One is a long drawn out game of building, the other is an intense combat game. These three weeks will allow, will give students pretty much an 80% coverage of design fundamentals. Every other lecture that I give them will just build on this. They'll have an understanding on how to build games, they'll understand on how to write them down, and they'll have an understanding on how systems work and how to analyze them. And that should be enough to get them through their first year. But our education is pretty much the same as it always is. I stand in front of the class, I read off some slides, and I give some coursework. Which sucks. Because we all know how games teach players. We, oh, we have a spare bullet, but bullet point. We take complex tasks and we break them down into atomic challenges. And then we ask, what skills are needed to achieve these challenges? We teach the easiest of these skills first and let the player try them out in a safe environment. We make sure that the first use of that skill is rewarding. And we make sure the skills that we teach them remain useful throughout the entire game. Our feed mark, feedback creates a sense of challenge while recognizing progress. Fail states and fairness are important. When we fail, we fail with a yet. This is the thing that games do so well. You fail because you suck, you're not good enough, you're lousy at the moment. If you put another quarter in and try again, you could be better because now you know where it's coming from. When you fail at coursework, you're just shit. We have to remember to fail with a yet. We talk about making scaffolded tra challenges, well-ordered challenges that enable us to form strong hypotheses for the future, more complex and unknown problems. And this is how we should be teaching. Build this. Because this is the essence of good learning, the desire to learn intrinsically, to discover information, to be able to answer a hypothesis that you're invested in, with the belief that you can succeed. I need to work out what slide comes next. And this is how we teach, this is how we should teach games, as if it was a game. Luckily, someone's written this book. Um, with great information about how to do this. Um, I will be trying. So why is this important? Andrea Koswalski <coughs> is a behavioral therapist I've just discovered on Google Plus, and she talks about novelty, challenge, and creative thought. Doing things the hard way and networking increase fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence increases gray brain matter. Now, anything creative and doing things hard creates this increases brain matter. Learning to juggle and unicycle at the same time creates new brain matter. They've put people in brain scans and checked them and they brought them out. Same thing happens with games. Fluid intelligence takes something, it's useful because it takes something that's unknown and solves that unknown. It doesn't answer a question. Because there's no answer to this question. It's an unknown thing. You solve a problem you're not aware of. And if anyone has seen that Web 2.0 movie, The Future is Happening and We've Already Missed the Boat, 
the stuff that you learn when you the stuff that you're taught in the first year when you go into education is obsolete by the time you come out at the end of your education. So we teach, what's the quote? We teach kids skills that are obsolete for problems that have already been solved and then send them out into a future with new problems they're unaware of, blah, 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 blah. Gaming teaches you how to solve problems that are unknown. And the motivation to persevere in games is the brain seeking just another surge of dopamine, the fuel of intrinsic reinforcement. Once you start learning how to solve unknown things, you want to serve un solve unknown things. Why is that slide at the end? I have no idea. So, games. They're not what you think they are. They are a method of expression where if you can analyze a system, you can build that system. It should be taught design-led, in my designer opinion, but you should approach it as a game. You should learn everything and read everything. Profit. Is there a last page? Games are the primary entertainment source for 126 million, million millennials in the US and the EU. That's 126 million minds that are waiting to have new problems for them to learn how to solve. In an expressive medium, that's the newest and potentially the most powerful that you've had. You probably learn how to use that properly. And that's me. Thank you. I will do questions, if there are any. Yeah, yes, question. Any questions? I haven't, but everyone keeps telling me to. Because that's the same guy, isn't it, that did the end of us? I've, I, they, very similar to Metro, yeah, no, I, I think my mate, the guy that showed me End of Us says, and you have to play all of his games, look, at it's the platform uh, in different stages of your life. Oh, no, they're Oh, then no, I've not played it. Yes, I have played that. That's with the um, yes, yeah. But they're beautiful, beautiful game. And again, not how you go and play that as well. That is actually yeah. Actually, it's four minutes to pass. Maybe you can solve it. Let me see. Do I have an internet connection? Let me. And I can leave that. Oh, let's do the safe way. While I'm looking for this, anybody else? Honestly, I'm not very scary and I will talk forever. So I'm possibly the worst person to ask that about. Um, I designed a, oh, is there, no, 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 I designed, let's do this. Hey folks, this oh, is last night. And let's turn that off so we haven't got to listen to him. Um, so I started out making games for PCs back in the day, so I did some stuff on Gender Wars with SCI, then became IDOS. I jumped into the original WAP games, and I made some Star Trek games for WAP. The games that you'll be most uh, aware of, I made some levels for Far Cry um, when I was working at Crytek, which was interesting to say the least. Um, 
And then I made a whole bunch of pervasive games. I made a, uh, low, a Facebook Pirates, Monsters, Ninjas game where I made people dress up and make movies and generally act very stupid to prove that people would play together. I then took that game onto the streets of Copenhagen and made a spy game where I got people running around dressing up. The first mission that they had was um, show me you're in a spy. So dress up as the spy that you're going to play. And we had a girl who had a huge coat and a moustache. And every time she did a mission, she had to wear this huge moustache. She had to paint this on every time she played, but that was your spy costume. Um, but then, then, then I sort of got into the industry. So I've not made, I've worked on many, many, many games that have never seen the light of day. Um, I've worked on strategy games and RPGs and I worked on a WAP-based MMO, Star Trek MMO. I had six um, six new races that Paramount had already signed off on, and then the then I left the company, and the um, and no one else then who had to make MMOs, and so that never saw the light of day, and I didn't get into the Star Trek encyclopedia which is very upsetting um, so yeah I've made a bunch of stuff that hasn't seen the life of day but made them across many many platforms and formats and genre types as people as I tell anybody as a designer all you really do is just and you hold to the highest bidder so oh that's what I did make I was on the team that made the hunter which is still running I was part of the company that did the um, social gaming on the side of it. Hunter's a 3D world hunting online game that was built, Avalanche built the, um, the hunting sim in their just cause engine and then we built the social framework that funneled it. Um, but yeah, stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I really am bad at that um, because I'm uh, I'm a lousy coder, uh, and as a designer, I'm well aware that my usefulness is very limited in a, a thing. I've made games in forty-eight hours that I'm surprised stay up for the length of the time that they play. Um, but I'm going to teach myself a bunch of, of code over summer so I can actually start doing them. Um, yeah. So I can, yeah, I, make, I can make a game in 48 hours, but I'm a terrible, terrible person when it comes to that. Yeah. <laughs> but some of the stuff that comes out of it is brilliant. Rovio just did one of the meanest things in the world, and I'm horrified by it. They just held their own game jam, and the winner of the game jam um, was able to uh, interview for an internship. And uh, three of our students won, so I'm very proud of that. But then uh, Rovio Finland, this is in Rovio Stockholm, and Rovio Finland said, sorry? We haven't agreed to that. And so even then, having gone through it and won the internship, they never actually got them. Yeah. Oh, that's... I'm a rogue like player I love net hack I suppose that was the one thing that I can never have on my machine my machine is a net hack like game um, I love long and involved uh, RPGs but only on a handheld device 
if I could make a game, that would be the game I could make. Some open world, story seeded, player driven RPG, which you could stay in for hours and hours at a time. And I would never play a game like that because I haven't got time to sit in front of a machine and do it. Unless it's on a DS. In which case, I will just play those things. I've just got Monster Hunter. Um, the joy of picking mushrooms to make things would never do that on uh, on my computer. But suddenly it's on my head. Well, it's not proper gaming, is it? It's just me doing this. And I know it's ridiculous, but the convenience of that. So that type of thing. Hot survival horror games. I love. I loved the Silent Hill games before they became less survival horror. Um, but that type of thing. Uh, having just railed about how we should make games different and they should be better than they are, I'll play any old game. Yes? I'm going to ask the most annoying question in the world. At the moment, what's your favorite game? I, I will tell you, and you will laugh. Um, I am, I, my wife, that's so new in my mouth. I have two. Um, I have an Android phone, and I've got Elder Signs, which is Arkham Horror Lite. Arkham Horror with absolutely none of the gameplay. It's just random dice rolling. Except it's not. They fix the dice and they cheat every time I play. Um, but I'm also playing Dragon Box 2. Dragon Box 2 is an algebra game. I have a dragon in a box. And it only comes out when it's on its own. And so all the game is built around getting the box on its own. And there's, there's fish and armadillo symbols and you can get the negative version of that to cancel them out, and you move this thing. And so they take you through, here's how you get the box on its own. And it starts off, and it's ridiculously easy. And then you get sort of towards the end levels, and it's incredibly complicated, bracketed math equations. But because you've been building the, the blocks on, well, if I do this with this, and I can convert this to that, and I can swap it around, it's really easy to carry on playing. So. It's become that and my... Oh, no. I'm playing Farmville 2. So I played Farmville and realized how horribly abusive that game was. And the, but I was addicted to the Skinner box really badly. I would grow eight-hour crops when I slept so I knew that I could harvest them when I woke up. And... Just, and the only way, no, even knowing how it worked, the only way I could stop playing was to sell the land after I'd harvested something. Otherwise, the temptation would be there. And then that was it. Never played it. Met the artist for Farmville 2 at GDC, and he says, it's not like that. It's a much better game, and we built this game by making the best game we could, and then we gave it away for free. And... Um, so I started playing, and it's brilliant. I want, I've always said that if I could have designed a game, I would have designed Pokemon, which is just, in terms of design, just breathtaking. Um, because the viral market, you can't buy one game, you have to buy two. You have to get your mate to buy the other color. For every game you sell, you sell another game. Why is there no... Games like this on mobile phones. It just, a, a, a device that's all about communication. Why do we not have communication games? So it's always been that. And then Farmville 2 came out. And missions are designed for me to grind certain crops. But they're designed in such a way that I'm not grinding crops, I'm just doing missions. Um, there's a really deep crafting system. I need to make pies. Well, to make pies, I need to plant trees. But to plant trees conveniently, I need to build um, groves where I can maximize my watering potential. But then to build groves, I need to ask help from my mates. Okay, so I build a grove and I plant some trees and I need to 
have some cows so I can get some milk and I need to make that milk into butter then I need to grind this flour so I need to have some wheat and then so I can do this and then I've built pies and I can see it's exactly the same grinding mechanic but it's just so well hidden I've been playing since March um, I have no real signs yet of slowing down on this game and it upsets me but it's just beautifully designed and beautifully balanced. And if you play it on Zynga's site, you only spam your friends that are playing the game. So now you haven't got to build a fake Facebook account just to play their games. It's just so that. I have it on. I have it on my desktop in my Chrome browser, and I starved the first time I played it. It was like, how am I ever going to play this game? And it's been one of those games that sits there taunting me. I know I want to have a set of time where I can actually sit down and pay attention to it, but I've been so busy I haven't dedicated that time to it yet. But just properly twisted as an idea and cruel hard in the way that 8-bit games were hard slaps you down but I, I'd imagine that even then running around failing to find food knowing I'm not going to find shelter knowing that I was going to die horribly just made me want to restart the game with more time so I could do it better so those fail states then <laughs> So the movement puzzle, the movement thing was one of our, one of the exercises we give the class and it's tied to this thing of impending doom. So there's an impending doom coming your way and you can't move. One of the teams built a game where you're in a burning building with a fire extinguisher and the fire extinguisher has a limited lifespan. And so you're putting out fires and you can either use a lot to put out fires that are close to you all the way back or you can use a little and put out fires before they stop but you there's no refill and throughout the, the soundtrack for the game is the emergency services on the line just hang on sir help is on the way just keep keep, keep calm sir we're almost there and this game is and you you don't survive you die you burn to death um, and you know you're going to burn to death because that's the that's the exercise that we gave them but when you're playing well if I just hang on a little bit longer they'll come and rescue me and no you die so yeah those games great oh then yes I'm playing that game <laughs> so did anyone pay attention to this yeah, okay, great. I won't have to play it anymore then. Yes. Yes, yes it is. Uh, have you played uh, Half-Life 2 Mars or No. Okay, I should write all these games down. <laughs> I played Half-Life 2 up to Scary Town. So here's my thing. I played Scary Town, and Scary Town was great. We never go to Scary... What's down here, Scary Town? We never go to Scary Town because it's scary. Okay, I'll know not to go there then. But now, here's an enormous robot that will save you safe from any farm, any, any harm you could possibly imagine. You now need to go to Scary Town. Can I take the robot with me? No. Why would we give you that? Played Scary Town, was terrified. Just, there's a monster over there. Well, at least it's far away. It's jumped on me! I've got one hit left! What am I going to do? Um, couldn't was lever blind. Ran around that whole map repeatedly. Couldn't find the lever. Left Scary Town, and was in boring driving sim, and then stopped playing. It was like I've gone from the scariest, most exciting experience I've ever had to driving, mm -hmm. and and yeah. So what was the name of the mod? Uh, terrible. And what do I do? That was one of the most interesting things about the opening of that game. 
Oh, great. That was the thing that really freaked me about out about the first time playing Half-Life 2. About, I mean, it's an FPS. And FPS, you run forward all the time. And so that opening of the game where I have no weapons and I have to run away, such a game culture shock. Like, what do you mean I'm being chased? I have no weapons. I have to run? Such a great idea. So we can say thank you to Adam for bringing that very <laughs>